violence is self-defeating. He who lives by the sword will perish by the sword. You know, when you construct a man as a great man, there's nothing almost more satisfying than also seeing him as the opposite. When the National Archive puts government documents up on the web, one has to confront them. Tapes from the hotel rooms, FBI reports, those are pieces of information that we shouldn't have. The FBI was most alarmed about King because of his success. He realized how sick this country was. We were trying to reveal the truth about segregation. Sam, a wonderful picture, um, outstanding film. So I think, uh, you know, a good way to start is just to ask you what, what made you want to make this film? Uh, you know, Topher, about two and a half years ago, the producer of this film, Ben Hedden, he had just read a book about uh, Dr. King and his relationship uh, during the civil, his, you know, his, the tensions he had with Jay Hoover and the FBI in the 60s. And he told me, he said to me, he said, Sam, I think this will be a great, great film. Be our, should be our next film. We had just finished this documentary, Two Trains Running, about the search for Sun House and Skip James in 1964 at the height of the civil rights movement in Mississippi. So I read the book. And I, after I read, I, I called him up. I said, Ben, I think you're absolutely correct. This is going to be a film that we should definitely try to tackle. Uh, the folks that you used in the film to kind of tell this story, um, the, the picture has a, a pretty wide scope. Like it, it, it covers a lot of, of, of time and geography and space, but you, yet there's a relatively small number of people that you use to tell the story. Um, talk about that. Talk about the decision to have such a tight cluster of voices uh, tell this kind of very expansive story. Well, normally, you know, when you're making these things, you want to try to get as many people as possible to talk to give you give you all what I call the the arc, the narrative arcs, the narrative through lines of the story. And usually, I've I've done documentaries where I've had fifteen, 15, ten to fifteen people that go throughout the film. But in this particular case, Ben and I both thought that we wanted to really get a small group of folks that we thought could really speak very specifically to. King, SCLC, Hoover, the FBI, and the, con and the country at that time. So we, we knew that if we could found two historians who could do that, that would really help. And we had Garrow, who was also a historian. So those three helped sort of create the foundation, and then we wanted to get the personal perspective. So we knew that we needed two of his trusted lieutenants, and the two that are surviving now are Andy Young and Clarence Jones. And then the icing on the cake for us was Let's see if we can get a former FBI agent who basically came up near the end of all this sincere investigation of Dr. King. And we found Chuck Knox. And then, you know, the realizing that this, the, the, the cherry on top was to get Comey. Yeah. I was going to ask you to talk about what parallels you feel uh, the film has for today, you know, both on political climate and in the black community's relationship with law enforcement in general. Very clear, very clear. The way that the, the police treat, treat the black people, those protesters, these peaceful, pro, peaceful protesters, you know, it's almost, you could, you could almost flip the script, flip the scenes and you see the same kind of reaction to the police or the protesters in the streets of the country today. You know, when you hear, you know, the idea that you know, we're moving too fast, that, you know, that there's a communist conspiracy that King is aligned with that's going to destroy a nation. You can flip it and you can hear people talking about it's Antifa, you know, this, this left-wing radical group that's going to help destroy the nation. The protesters are feeding into that. The same stuff. I mean, in, it's, in many ways, it's very tragic to still hear this kind of stuff in 2020. I was a young man in the 60s, a teenager, and I thought that after that, you know, that the tumultuous 60s, 1966, 67, 68, that the world would be would have changed, but not so, not so. 